All right. We are good to go. Just a little bit. Those of you in person, you can see the people on the side. That's fine. No big deal. As long as the people who are at home can see the whiteboard. And obviously those you here can see up there. We're good to go. This is our first in-person lecture. We're going to have 14 total. If you look at the calendar, you're going to see we have a nice string of them in a row, four in a row, and then the first assessment after that. Now, this is probably going to be the only one where we don't need the full class period because those of you who have already looked through chapter one, you'll know it's the shortest one of all of the chapters. Now, before we begin, I'm going to make a promise to you. Before that, I need to give you some context. How many of you have taken any math class or the instructor shows you how to do something, but they never tell you what you can do with it. And so you feel like it was a complete waste of time. Those of you who are at home, that's pretty much the entire class with their hand up. And the issue is y'all probably know maybe on Facebook or something, people make these jokes. Oh, I'm never going to use math. And even though you can, you can't blame them. They were never taught that they could actually use it somewhere. How many of you were taught percentages in middle school? This smells the class, those of you at home at well. Now, for, and I imagine that most of you have probably at least gone to a dining restaurant before. How many of you, when you have to give your tip, you just make a guess or you pull out your phone calculator? That's a lot of the people in person as well. Well, there's a nice little trick you can use with the percentage stuff that I guarantee most of you probably weren't taught. Let's say you want to do a 15% tip. 15% is 10% plus 5%. 5% is half of 10%. So if we take those two and together, we're done. 10%, we just knock a decimal place off and we're there. Here's an example. Let's say your bill is $39.80 and you want to do a 15% tip. 10% of that, knock off a decimal place, $3.98. Divide that by two, half of that, $1.97. Add those together, $5.97. Easy as that. Now, the thing is, though, I guarantee you missing to do it, not because you, weren't, you didn't know that was the case, but because they never taught you it. And so my promise to you in this course is obviously I will teach you how to do things. Here, let me take my mask off so you can hear me better. I will teach you how to do things, but I will make an effort to show you what you can actually do with it. So hopefully, when you come out of this course, it's not just going to be, oh, I know how to do it, but you actually know what you can do with it. And that's the promise I make to all of you here and all of you at home. I will actually show you what you can do with it. So. This first chapter, it's a lot of definitions. If you look through, it's the way it is. Usually with most courses, we kind of have to start with the basis and then work from there. In this one, we're going to be working with a lot of data, both for exams, assessments, you name it. And before you can even work with any kind of data you have, you have to know how to organize it. How many people here are business majors? This is most of the class. Y'all know very well. I'm, I'm sure some of you have you had to take something called like business communication or media communications or whatever. I imagine you'll have to take something like that. You can't, you can't interpret the data. You can't summarize it unless you know how to organize it. So most of what we're going to talk about today is organizing the data we have. And then from there, we'll actually start getting into the calculations and the metrics that we use. So here on the board, imagine, is this big enough font for all of y'all to see? So here we have a data of 50 countries that are a part of the World Trade Organization. Those of you that don't know what that is, essentially it's, it's a forum where a bunch of countries can make establishing trade agreements and whatnot much easier for each other. There's two types of people in the, or countries and organization, members and observers. The difference, generally speaking, observers are people or countries who are working on becoming a, part, a member of the trade organization, but they're just not fully there yet. So you can see everyone here, most of our members, we have a couple of observers like Russia and Serbia, and I think that's Azerbaijan. You'll notice a lot of those are countries that were part of the ex-Soviet Union, more, those are relatively newer countries, so to speak. And we have in our second column, our per capita GDP, I imagine since most of your business majors, you know what that is, that's basically how productive the citizens are and so on and so forth. Now, technically they don't just give this table, you have to make it yourself. And the first thing is obviously, as we all know, I mean, you can write this down if you want, it doesn't really matter, it's kind of obvious. This data we have, these are the facts and figures that we have to collect and summarize to actually put it in the, day, in the table. And so this is what we might call our data set. Now, for here, all of this, the status, GDP, trade deficits, so on and so forth, we collected this for each country in question. 
this is the first definition that's actually going to matter. Our elements are our first column. The elements are what we collect the data on. So for example, Armenia is an element, Ireland's an element, member is not. That's the data that we collect on these elements. It is very good practice and something you should always do. Put your elements in the first column. It makes no sense whatsoever to have World Trade Organization status and per capita GDP in the first, first and second columns. I mean, this is just kind of data organizing 101. Most of y'all know this, but you know, we, we need to establish it anyways for those that don't. Everything else, these other five columns, these are our variables. And our variables are the characteristics of interest that we have for each element. So for here, how many variables do we have? Anyone? Five, yeah. World Trade Organization status, per capita GDP, trade deficit, Fitch rating, Fitch outlook, those are our five variables. If you organize your data correctly, it's very easy to figure out how many variables you have. Your first column is your element, the number of columns after that is how many variables you have. Now, a lot of people might look at, say we have member for Armenia, and people might say that's an observation. Well, no, our observation is that entire row of data corresponding to Armenia. Member is data. That entire row is our observation for Armenia. Now, all these numbers, you can get them off the website, but you have to find it yourself. They don't put it in the table like this. So before you can do any, so let's say you, did, you wanted to do a linear regression and find the correlation coefficient between per capita GDP and trade deficit. You can't even do that until you organize the data properly. Now, this part I'm gonna get, this is the first, this next part right here. You will see this all over the assessment. You're gonna see it all over the web work. There are four different scales of measurement. Those of you who have already started the web work will note that one of these hasn't shown up as much. The first scale of measurement we have is called the nominal scale of measurement. And these, they're labels and names. The order of them doesn't matter. So for an example, our World Trade Organization status, that is an example of a nominal scale of measurement. You're a member or you're an observer. You're one or the other. Doesn't, for the grand scheme of things for our, for our table, doesn't really matter which one you are. It's just data that we collected. A member is a member, an observer is trying to become a member. One of them is not necessarily better than the other one. So in this case, the order doesn't matter. So another example, our Fitch outlook. That's another example of a nominal scale of measurement. Now you might ask, what do what those words even mean? Well, Fitch is a company that assesses, generally speaking, credit ratings and whatnot, and they tell you how reliable any kind of entity might be for giving loans and whatnot. Now for this case, stable would mean they expect their growth and their potential to be largely where they're at right now. Obviously positive means they're gonna keep growing. Negative means they're going downhill. Now you might say, well, hold on. Isn't negative worse than positive? Yes, but here the order we put it in doesn't matter. So in this case, our outlook's gonna be another example of a nominal scale of measure. Now you'll notice nominal is pretty much always gonna to have to deal with data that are words. Technically speaking, if we wanted to, we could let member be the integer one, an observer be the integer zero, so zero or one. Those of you who've taken computer science before will know that's how computers process true and false. But generally speaking, nominal is gonna be associated with actual words. The other scale of measurement that is, that is pretty much always associated with words are what we would call the ordinal scale of measurement. Like with nominal, it's with labels and names. The only difference is that with ordinal, the order actually matters. So for example, Great, great example, letter grades. In this class, you're gonna get an A plus, an A, B, C, or an F. A B is better than a C, C is better than an F. The order matters, so we call that an ordinal scale of measurement. On this chart we have here, our Fitch rating is an example of an ordinal scale of measurement. AAA is the highest, which means pretty much you're safe putting your money there. B minus, which is the lowest, I believe, is that we have on here. I think there's a B, yeah, B minus for, I believe Ecuador right here. Oh, come on. There we go. That's our lowest. AAA, you can see AAA is everywhere. Those are our highest. A B is better than the B minus. AAA is better than A. Order matters here. And so we call that ordinal. So this is something I'd write down. You probably want to have it on your formula sheet as well. The only difference between nominal 
and ordinal is with ordinal, the order matters. So if you get it down to one of those two, all you have to ask yourself is this. Does it matter what order I put this in? With the world organization status and our Fitch outlook, or didn't matter. I mean, a damn thing. Same thing in terms of ordering. Doesn't matter if we put member first or observer first. Doesn't matter. On the other hand, with Fitch rating, we can't put AAA before AA plus because AAA is better. So now those are the ones that generally speaking have to do with words. We have two other ones that generally have to do with our numbers. The first one is called the interval scale. Intervals, these are always numbers, always. They're all, if, it's, if it's not a number, it's not gonna be interval. Now these ones, they're non boolean Now when I say non-Boolean, right, what you ask, what do I mean by non-Boolean? Boolean means true, false. True, false can be coded as zero or one. So that's what I mean by non-Boolean. So, you know, if instead for World Trade Organization status, we put one for member and zero for observer, doesn't matter, still not interval. Now for intervals, the ratios between two different numbers, generally speaking, don't mean anything. So for example, let's say you take the ACT. How many of you took the ACT or the SAT to get admitted into tech? That's pretty much everyone here. They scale your score. They don't give you your raw score. They don't tell you got, well, oftentimes they won't tell you got 10 out of 20 correct or 15 out of 20 correct. They scale your score and give you that. Someone who got an 18 on the, S on the ACT didn't necessarily do twice as good as someone who got a nine out of, I uh, got nine. They don't, the ratio doesn't mean anything. Another example is temperature. 40 degrees Fahrenheit versus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. 40 is not twice as warm. We, they're both cold. <laughs> now, on the other hand, we have ratio. The difference between ratio and interval is that with ratio, as the name implies, our ratios mean something. So for example, per capita GDP, that's an excellent example of something we would call the ratio scale. For example, we have Denmark, they make about 40,000 per capita GDP and Poland has about 20,000. That 40,000 is basically twice as much as our 20,000. So they are twice as productive. It means something. Now, as a note, because a ratio implies that our quotient means something, this means ratio can't go negative. So for example, our trade deficits, they can go negative, which means the trade deficit has to be interval. Now you might ask, hold on, if someone has a trade deficit of 33 billion, another one has 60, 16 billion, doesn't that, doesn't that mean they have twice as much? Well, yes, but remember what happens if someone has 33 billion and negative 33 billion? What does negative one even mean? That doesn't mean anything. And so in that case, if you have negative numbers, you're inter it's definitely gonna be interval. That's another reason why the temperature scale that I just mentioned is an example of interval, because temperature, we all know, temperature can go negative. If you've been further up north, say in Montana or Alaska, it, it goes negative pretty regularly. Now, to help figure out if any kind of data you have is interval, ratio, ordinal, or nominal, it helps to broadly speaking categorize your data in one of two different ways. The first type is what we would call categorical data. And categorical data is associated with a categorical variable. We put something into, into some sort of category. World Trade Organization status, you're a member of observer, you're one of two categories, so categorical variable. Fitch outlook, you're stable, positive, or negative. It's one of those three. So categorical variable. Let me see if there was chat, we have a bunch of chat pop up. Sorry, I didn't see the questions. Let me pull it up in chat. No, you're looking at the graph right now, the one we have on the board. That's what we're looking at. Yes, that's what you're supposed to be looking at. And that is what I'm talking about. You should be able to see the whiteboard right now. Aren't you guys at home able to see what I'm sharing on the screen? Okay. So for, for first of all, order that doesn't matter. For nominal, order does not matter. Nominal is World Trade Organization status. Your member of observer doesn't matter which one we put first. Now you might say, what do you mean put first? I don't have to put one first. That's correct. You don't have to put one before the other. Doesn't matter. 
For ordinal, order does matter. It's a, if it helps, remember a good phonic, ordinal, order. For Fitch rating, let me write this down for those of you at home, and actually for those of you in person as well. Our Fitch rating, we can have A, A, A. We can have A, A. I believe they go to plus after that. We can have A, 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 A minus. We keep on going until we have B plus, B, B minus. No, so the whiteboard, we are not using the whiteboard in class. The reason why I'm projecting this on the board is that, for example, let's say you get the coronavirus. You can at least stay at home. You can watch what I'm doing. So this whiteboard, for those of you at home, is what you're seeing right now, the paint. That's what I'm using. Let me just make sure I didn't miss anything. Interval versus ratio. These one, this is a little bit trickier. With interval, you can go negative. So if you see negative numbers, it's interval pretty much end of story. Now, with interval, let's say we take two of our numbers in the interval scale and we divide one into the other one. That's going to give us a ratio. So, for example, if we have, to use the example here, we have this per capita GDP of 40,200 for Denmark, and we have the 20,100 for Poland. So, let's divide those two into each other 4,200, divide that by our 2,100. And this, that's pretty much exactly two. So the ratio here is two. The question you have to ask yourself is, does this two mean anything? And for the case of our per capita GDP, the answer is yes. Because 40,200, that those citizens on average are twice as productive as the citizens in Poland. That ratio means something. You'll also note we don't go negative with per capita. You can't be negatively productive. <laughs> even, if you're, even if you're blowing up the whole university, you're technically not being productive. It's zero. You're doing nothing. So the two main differences between interval and ratio, interval can go negative. The ratio means nothing. You can take any two values, or we call it the quotient if we want to use a different word, quotient. Take the quotient of two of the values. Does that quotient mean anything? So a Fitch rating, Fitch is a credit company and they assess you know, how basically trustworthy someone is. Basically a Fitch rating says how trustworthy some sort of entity is. An entity could be a country, it could be a company, it could be a person, kind of like with credit ratings. And AAA means they're very trustworthy. You give them a loan, they will almost certainly at least pay the interest back to make your loan pay itself off, even if they haven't paid the whole loan off. On the other hand, say B minus means you're taking a risk and taking it with them. To give a good analogy, let's say someone took Calculus 2, you have two students, one who got a C in Calculus 2, and the other one got an A+. Plus. If, well, let's say you get $1 million if one of the students gets at least a 90 on the Calculus final exam. If you bet on the A+, plus, you're almost certainly getting that $1 million because they know what they're doing. The C, they might get the 90, it's not all that likely. In that same sense, our Fitch rating assesses how risky an investment with them is. Generally speaking, you're better off investing in Australia than you would be for Ecuador because they have a better rating. So that's what a Fitch rating is. Now, did I answer all the questions for those of y'all in chat? Hopefully I got them all. Let me just double check. All right. Now, going back to categorical and quantitative. If you want to draw a graph, a graph here helps. And I'll actually start one here. Let me minimize this. So we have our four types of data. We have our nominal. nominal. We have our ordinal. I'm just going to use the first three letters. We have our interval. And we have our ratio. Nominal and ordinal data, generally speaking, have to do with the words. And these are what we would call categorical data. So I'm just going to spell the whole thing out. Categorical data. So as the name implies, you put them into a category. Now, for example, with our per capita GDP, they could be zero dollars, they could be one dollar, they could be two, three, four, five, six, seven. You can have all the decimals in between if you want. There are just simply so many numbers, you can't put that into a category. So that's not going to be categorical. Generally speaking, the easiest way to differentiate between categorical and quantitative is to ask yourself this. Is there a clearly finite number 
like i.e. a limited number of ways I can categorize this. So for example, let's say on TTU, we have all these buildings and we ask ourselves how many classrooms are in each building. Now the thing is, there's gonna be a finite number of classrooms. There aren't infinite classrooms. You can't really have half of a classroom because you know, if we just took this half of the classroom and threw it out the window, the other half still exists. So it's still a classroom. There's no decimals in between. Technically speaking, we can still categorize them based on how many classrooms they have. On the other hand, let's say we're dealing with cars and we're dealing with their mileage, their, their miles per gallon. That can be a decimal. It can be 13.14567. We can go up to 27. We can have every decimal in between. You can't categorize that. You just can't. You're better off putting that on what we might call quantitative data. So our intervals, our interval data and our ratio data, what we would call is quantitative data. The main difference is that one of them is pretty much numbers. Quantitative is always numbers. Categorical is almost always words. To go back to, to, go back to the exception, again, with Boolean, true or false can be zero or one. If it's zero or one, you put that in categorical. So if you see decimals, pretty much always quantitative. If you see words, always categorical. If you see integers, or what we might call whole numbers, the only question you have to ask yourself is this. Is there a limited number of them? So why do I bring this up? This helps you figure out what type of data something is much easier than just starting with the four. So for example, let's go back up to this chart. With our World Trade Organization status, instead of asking ourself, ourselves, is it nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio, we can instead ask ourselves, is it categorical or quantitative? You can answer that correctly. You're already halfway there to the correct answer. Obviously, it's a, it's, it's a word. And it's member or observer, so pretty obviously it's going to be its categories. Just like that, you've already thrown out two of the possibilities, even though you haven't answered the question. And you get your odds of answering it correctly way higher. So if you have any kind of question, this is going to come up on the assessment, it's going to come up on the web work, where it asks you, what type of scale of measurement is this? Instead of just immediately answering the question, what you should first ask yourself is, what type of data is this, quantitative or categorical? With our trade deficit, that is very obviously quantitative. We have negatives, we have positives. Technically, trade deficit can go into the decimals and the trade deficits can be all over the place. Theoretically, our trade deficit can go deep and deep into the negative trillions or positive trillions. It can go wherever we want it to go. There are pretty clearly an unlimited number of trade deficits you can have. So this trade deficit is very clearly quantitative. And just like that, it can't be nominal, can't be ordinal. So when you're doing these tests in your homeworks, if you want, you can just go straight into it and figure out which the four it is. I would recommend answering that question first. That'll also help because you'll have some other questions that just flatly ask you categorical or quantitative. Now, for those of you that have already started the web work, you'll notice for some of the problems, they don't include ratio as a possibility. And they'll, they'll just give you nominal, ordinal, or interval. Well, the nice thing about that is if they do that and you know it's quantitative, boom, you got the right answer, you're done. And for, for those web work ones, you get two chances at those types of problems. So you'll notice if you get that categorical or quantitative correct, that pretty much guarantees you'll get the credit for the problem. So before we continue, are there any questions about our scales of measurement in which the two types data we can categorize them as? All right, let me pull up chat to see if anyone in person asked something. All right, seems like we've cleared up a lot of the confusions. Now, additionally, our data when we record it is also important. For example, right now I can go up to every person in class, male or female, easy as that, or I guess one of the 5 million genders in between nowadays, but generally speaking, male or female. I do that right now, that's all in time. We call that cross-sectional data. That's gonna come up. Cross-sectional data, we do it all at one time, so theoretically you can say the time didn't matter. Now, as an example, I guess all this data right here, this is all cross-sectional data. You pull up the website, you get all that data, you organize it in this table, you got all of this data for our World Trade Organization data. We got it all at once. This is cross-sectional. The other type is what we would call time series data. As the name implies, we get it over time. So for example, 
What we could do, let's suppose we talked about just the trade deficit and we focused on Armenia. We could get their trade deficit in August of 2010, and then August of 2011, August of 2012, so on and so forth. That is time series. We got it over time. We got it at multiple points in time. So, for example, sticking with the in-person examples, your pupils, the dilation, it can be, you know, say it could be just maybe one millimeter or it could be much more than that. What could happen is right now we have pretty much all the lights on. I could go right now to every single person, if I was a scientist, which I'm not, and try to measure all of your pupil dilations and write that down on the board. Then I could turn off every single light, wait 15 minutes and do it again. That data, initially it was cross-sectional because we did it all at once, but the moment I wait 15 minutes with the lights off and do it again, now we're time series. So as an example, over here, our first one, I, I imagine most of you who are business majors are very familiar with the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It's basically, it's an aggregation of the stocks I believe there might be a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's basically an aggregation of the stock values of the 30, generally speaking, biggest corporations in the United States. So here we collect, we have, we start with September of 2005. We get it every single day slash month from there all the way to September of 15. So for example, right here in September of 2005, that's about 10,500, we keep moving through. We see the low point comes after the Great Recession, about middle of 2008. That looks like it's somewhere around 7,000. Time moves on, about six years later, we get to the end of it and we are at about 16,000. This is recorded over time. We put it on a graph. Generally speaking, if your horizontal axis is time, that's a pretty clear indicator it's going to be time series. You'll know all three of these are time series. The next one, this is McDonald's' net income for over 2007 to 2015. Obviously, with the Great Recession happening, their income is going to go up because people can't afford to eat out, like dine in restaurants as much as they could, so they have to settle for a cheaper alternative. On the other hand, recovery starts happening, get to 2015, it's not as high because people can afford that more now. Now, this last one is very prescient to the condition nowadays. This is occupancy rate of hotels. Now, granted, this is not from this year, it's from earlier ones in South Florida, but you could probably pretty safely imagine if you did this for South Florida, but then projected it and got all the data all the way up to the present day, you could imagine if we got to the present day, you'd probably be looking at something like that. So all these are example of time series, whereas everything we had in our previous one right here is cross-sectional. So therefore, Broadly speaking, as broadly as possible, we have four different types of data. It can be cross-sectional and categorical. And an example of that is our WTO status. So just write it down here so you have it. Cross-sectional and categorical. That's our first category of four types, broadly speaking. Our second one, it's cross-sectional and quantitative. An example of that, trade deficit per capita GDP. That's an example of something that is cross-sectional and quantitative. And then we have the other two types. We have our time series and categorical. So if you wanted to, I guess, technically an example of that, you could take everyone's gender here. You could wait 10 years. Maybe someone transgendered and they became the other gender. That's fine. In which case, change, still categorical, but now it's over time. And our, now we don't have an example of that up here right now because generally speaking, time, time series and categorical is generally speaking the least common. Because if you're measuring something over time, generally speaking, it's actual hard numerical data. And our final one, as you've probably written down by now, the one that we haven't written down here yet, is time series and quantitative. And a good, a good example of that is our Dow Jones industrial average. We did it over time. Our average is clearly a number. It can go into the decimals as many of you who are business majors know. Likewise, with the income, obviously we know that's quantitative. We're doing it over time, so it's quantitative and time series. I don't think it's on the web work, it might be. 
on the assessment, you will have to identify which of these four types something is. And unlike with the scales of measurement, you have to answer both. It's basically you get one of the four. Again, I recommend starting off asking yourself, is it categorical or quantitative? You get that right, you're down to two options. For example, if we start with that World Trade Organization example of member or observer, if you correctly identify that it's categorical, you've already gotten rid of two of the possible options, you're down to two. And obviously at that point in time, we just, you collected all at one point in time, so it would be cross-sectional. So in general, if you're being asked what type of data something is, whether it's the scale of measurement or just in general, which of these types it is, the first question you should always ask yourself, cross-sectional, I'm not cross-sectional, categorical or quantitative. Has to be one or the other. You get that right, you get your odds of getting it right way higher. Does all that we've gone over here make sense so far? Okay, now before we get to the last part of the chapter, I'm going to, let me minimize this, scroll up. Now this is from one of the handouts, and like I said on Blackboard, with the handouts, we'll work some of them in class. We might not, depends on what time we have available. So right here, we have fuel efficiency ratings for 10 cars. I'm gonna give y'all both at home and in person a moment. I'll give you maybe a couple of minutes. Go through this and try to answer those questions on your piece of paper. Maybe a couple minutes from now, 640, we'll talk about it. So give you all a chance to practice it. Uh, someone asked me to make it bigger. Let me zoom in a little bit. Sorry for those of you who that may have blocked out. That better? Now, when it says ID the data structure, what it's asking is categorical or quantitative. And then when it says measurement scale, that's pretty obvious. person who asked to chat, I'll pull yours up in a second. I don't want to accidentally block the board. Right. Give me a quick second to pull up the chat. It might block the board. Let me see if I can pull it out of the way. No, there's nothing to hear. You, you, have, you have a couple of minutes to work on this example here before we go over it together. Seems like there's still some people in person working on it, so I'll give you all an extra minute or two and then we'll discuss it. Now I will point out the hardest one is the cylinders. Make sure you carefully think about that one. That one's definitely the hardest one on here. And as a note, miles per gallon, that can be decimals. We've just rounded it here to make it easier to see, but that can go into decimals.
those of you in person, is there anyone who still needs some more time to finish it? Is there anyone at home who needs a little bit of extra time to finish it? All right, well then we'll get started. With the first one, if you're so willing, hold up the number of fingers that you think are elements. All right, we got a mix of, we got some mostly tens, we got some fives and six. The answer is 10. We have 10 different cars. You recall, if your graph is organized or your, your graph, if your table is organized correctly, your first call is number of elements. We got 10 cars, we have the Audi, the BMW, Cadillac, Chevrolet, Chrysler, Ford Focus, Hyundai, Pontiac, Toyota, Volkswagen, that's 10. Now variables, number of fingers, how many variables do you think there are? Mostly five, couple people with six. There are five. Remember, the first column is our elements. So generally speaking, the number of variables we'll have is the number of columns minus one. When we take these cars, we see what class is it? Cylinders, the two types of miles per gallon, but before fuel type, that's five. So we have five variables. Now the data structure will go variable by variable. We'll go class cylinders, miles per gallon, miles per gallon, fuel type. Now, technically, even though I didn't ask it here, is all this data we have, cross-sectional time series. Hands up if you think it's cross-sectional. Yes, it is cross-sectional. We got all this at one point in time. Nothing, it's not over time, so this is gonna be cross-sectional. Now we're gonna go variable by variable here. We'll do, well, we'll do a show of hands as well. With class, how many people think the class is categorical? That is correct. All, it's gonna be large, compact, or mid-size, it's one of those three. And it's obviously it's a limited amount, categorical, words, words are pretty much always categorical. Now, cylinders, this is a tricky one. How many do you think it's categorical? Got, I think four. How many of you think this is quantitative? It's most of the class, it's the tricky one. This one's actually categorical. This is, it's a tricky one, here's why. First of all, it's all integers. You can't have half of a cylinder or else your car is gonna go flying off into a tree and you might be dead. So there's no decimals. We also know you can't have zero cylinders either or else your car is not moving. But here's what we also know. Your car isn't gonna have 500 cylinders. You just, that's too many. So we have a limited number, no decimals. It's gonna be categorical. You have three cylinders or well here, our lowest. You can have four cylinders, you can have six, you can go all the way up to 12. When you see the whole numbers with no zeros and they're clearly limited, that's where it can sometimes be tricky. So our cylinders is actually gonna be categorical. City miles per gallon and highway miles per gallon. How many of y'all think that's categorical? I think it's quantitative. That's everyone that's right. Because remember, these can go decimals. I suppose you can go pretty high if you really try to mix it, but most importantly, we can go as far into the decimals as we want. You can't categorize that, so that's quantitative. Same with highway miles per gallon. Finally, fuel type. How many of y'all think that's categorical? Quantitative? Categorical is right, supreme or regular, it's one or the other. Let me see, we have a chat question up. It really depends on the type of it. Generally speaking, our limited whole numbers tend to be categorical, but remember, part of this is going to be the context. So for example, let's say we're talking about car prices. They pretty much never send your car prices into the decimal places. So technically, and obviously a car shouldn't be costing zero dollars. So technically that car, it could be thousand dollars, it could be a thousand two hundred. That's actually still gonna be quantitative because we still have a lot of it. When we, the, generally speaking, if you have whole numbers that become categorical, there is a noticeably limited number. So here, this is clearly limited. Four, five, six, eight, 12. You can have some in between, obviously, but it's pretty limited. So that's why, generally speaking, when you see the whole numbers, that's where things can get a little bit tricky. Now, measurement scale. So we'll start with the class. How many of y'all think that's nominal? Got a few. How many of y'all think that's ordinal? Got a couple. How many of y'all think that's interval? and ratio. Well, it's gonna be nominal. It's gonna, it, obviously we know, we know it's categorical. So it has to be one of the first two. 
Obviously, there's a difference between large and compact, but we're not necessarily saying that compact is better than large the other way around. We'll have our opinions, but as a practical matter in terms of objective fact, we're not necessarily saying that one is better than the other. We haven't done any formulas yet. <laughs> we'll be getting the form chapter two is where the formulas start coming along. Now, cylinders. Now, some of you, most of y'all probably had it as quantitative. Now that you have, no, it's categorical, I'll give you a quick moment to figure out whether you think it's nominal or ordinal. And now as a little hint, obviously 12 cylinders is more than eight. <laughs> so how many of y'all think it's nominal? Ordinal. This one's gonna be ordinal because 12 cylinders is more than eight. Generally speaking, if you have whole numbers that are categorical, then it's going to very likely be ordinal. They're pretty much the only time that's not gonna happen is when it's zero or one, which is Boolean. Yes, categorical is nominal and ordinal, which I believe we have that, let me pull up the table back up for you guys, right down here. This is our little graph. Let me zoom out just a little bit. That's our graph. Categorical is nominal or ordinal. Quantitative is interval or ratio. I'll wait just a sec for the people at home who need to write that down if they didn't get it. So I'll leave this just for a moment. And by the way, the whiteboard, I will be taking that and I created a folder, folder called lecture notes. I'll be taking this and putting that into the folder. Now, obviously you might think, hold on, then why should I show up in person or on Zoom? Because obviously y'all know not everything I have said that I have written down here. I just written down the things that are more visual and help you with it. But I will take the entire whiteboard and upload it to Blackboard. So the textbook, you don't actually have to get the textbook. Every material that you'll need is either taught in person or over Zoom. And also you can find Blackboard for the extra materials. Cylinders was ordinal and categorical. The reason why is because there's a limited number of cylinders. You can't have half of a cylinder or else your car is not a car. You're gonna fly off into a tree. And it's ordinal because 12 cylinders is very clearly more than six. We're not saying it's necessarily better, but it's very clearly more. You, you, can't, you can't say that six cylinders is more than eight, because it's not. Now, let me zoom back in, because that's where we had it. City miles per gallon. How many of y'all think that's nominal? Ordinal? Interval, ratio. It is ratio because if we have 25 miles per gallon like we have here, let me make sure I have the brush on. We have 25 here. That is about twice as much as the Audi. So we can say that when we're in a city, a Hyundai Elantra will be about twice as efficient with regards to using gas than the Audi. By that same logic, it should be pretty clear the highway miles per gallon is also going to be ratio. Finally, fuel type. I think I think that's nominal. Ordinal. Obviously, it's not going to be ratio or interval, so it is nominal. So again, notice we did part C first because it makes it easier to do part B. Knowing that our cylinders is categorical makes it way easier to figure out which type of scale of measurement that it is. So, so you can clearly see from this example, the main purpose of this example obviously gets you acquainted with it but also get you used to answering that question first. With any type of data, whether or not it directly asks you if it's categorical or quantitative, always answer that question first. It'll make it much easier to get the answer correct if you answer that correctly. It's also easier to answer that question, generally speaking. Because if, if you can't figure out if it's categorical or not, then you're probably not gonna get if it's ordinal or nominal, given that you would have to know it's categorical unless you know, you guess on it. Now, any questions for people in person or at home over this example we just did? All right, I'll wait just a second for anyone at home if they had a question. Now, the last part is, now that we've we found this data, the question is, what do we do with it? Because for example, if we go back to our examples of the countries. Clearly, this is not all the countries. No, we're close. It's obvious because the USA is not on there. And United Kingdom aren't on there, so on and so forth. This is not everything. This is what we would call a sampling of all of the countries 
and the World Trade Organization. A sample are the elements that we draw from all of the possible candidates. So there's about 200 countries. We sampled 50 of them. Those 50 people constitute our sample. And although we're not really there yet, you can call those 50 people our sample size. Nice little note, the number of elements is always gonna be the same as the sample size, unless you took everybody, in which case it's our population. But we'll get the population in a moment. So our sample are all of the elements that we actually sampled from the population. So for example, here we just randomly picked 50. These are our 50, that's our sample. Now the population are all of the possible elements and entities that we could have actually chosen for our sample. So I imagine there's maybe, I don't know, 40 people in this room right now. The 40 of you is the population of students in person right now. If I randomly pick 10 of you, say, say I took all the people on the left side and all the people on the right side and put you all together, that would be a sample of about 10 people. Let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. yeah, 10 people but that wouldn't be the entire class. Now, I imagine many of y'all are familiar with student evaluations. The hopes that the university has is that everyone fills them out. As a practical matter, that often doesn't happen because many people are busy and these evaluations can sometimes take time. So the hope they have is that of the students who fill them out, they're hoping it's gonna be representative of the population as a whole. The purpose of taking a sample is to hope that they will be representative of the population as a whole. And you'll notice as we go throughout the entire course, that is probably the fundamental assumption that we're making. Every sample we're taking, we make the fundamental assumption that it should be pretty representative of the population as a whole. So there's 120 something of you, let's say 60 of you fill out the evaluations. We would make, we make the assumption and have the hope that the evaluations of those 60 people are gonna be representative as if we had everyone do. So our population, every possible person we can pick, sample the people we actually picked. You'll obviously note the sample is always less than the population. Because if the sample size is equal to the population, then it's the population. And the purpose of a sample is to pick people and hope they're representative. Now you might ask, well, hold on, our class is 120 people. What if we just force people to fill everything out? It's only 120 people. Sure, but let's say presidential elections, they do polls of those. You cannot go through and poll 155 million people. There is just not enough time in the day for that. So you have to pick say a thousand people as your sample and hope that it will be as representative as possible of the actual general electorate. So give an example, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Georgia runoffs that happened in January. They were doing polls of that. The polls pretty much nailed the margin. So our samples in those polls were representative of the population as a whole. On the other hand, I'm sure many of you have heard that once again, the polls in the Rust Belt, you know, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, especially Wisconsin, were completely off this year. Biden won them, but it was close. And obviously in 2016, all those states, the polls were saying Clinton was gonna win them handily, even though she lost all three. In those states, our samples were not representative of the population as a whole. And the question of many pollsters, and will be, will be a question for y'all, if you get out in the business world and you have to get people's feedback. Let's say you work for CVS, you try out a new product, you wanna know how people think about it. You can't survey every single person who bought the product because most of them aren't gonna fill it out even if you ask them to. So you have to hope and do what you can to make sure that sample you get will be as representative of everyone as possible. Now we will talk about techniques you can use to make those samples as representative as possible. That's gonna be, I believe in chapter two or chapter three. Now, obviously that this is just a bit of formality. A sample survey is associated with a sample. Kind of obvious, it's implied in the name. If you take 50 people or say these, 50 countries, that is our sample survey of the entirety of all the countries in the World Trade Organization. A census, which I'm sure many of y'all probably filled out the census that we just had for 2020. It was a bit of a mess, but you probably still filled it out. A census is essentially, think of a census as a survey, but of everyone. So technically, when we had that presidential election back in November, you can think of that presidential election as a census of all of the people who voted whereas the polls were a sample survey of randomly selected people. 
Now, when we do these things, there's broadly speaking two types. We have what we call an observational study and an experiment. With an observational study, an example of that, again, pretty much every single thing that I have showed you on this whiteboard are our World Trade Organization stuff, our time series graphs, the example we worked out, all of those are examples of what we would call an observational study. You just take the data, you look at it, it's not under controlled conditions. Experiments, we handle them under controlled conditions. And the reason why is because you're trying to isolate the effect of one variable on the entire population. So for example, going back to this cars example, maybe you wanna find out how much of an effect the number of cylinders has on city miles per gallon. So what we might do is find, we, we can take a bunch of cars, we can hold everything else, oh, we can hold everything else constant except for the number of cylinders. And then we can run a controlled experiment to see how those cylinders impact it. The main difference is that with an observational study, you're not controlling anything. You just take what you already have and work with it. With an experiment, you basically make the data yourself. So that's the difference with the two of them. And generally speaking, observational studies tend to be associated with cross-sectional because you take the data all at one point in time. But of course, there are exceptions. There are, there are exceptions to that, just a very, very, very broad in general. And obviously, experiments, experiments tend to be associated with over time. Because if you do an experiment, you did it over time. If you're, if you're controlling something, they're doing it over time. Like, for, again, the example we had of the pupils. I turn off the lights, that's over time. That's still a sample survey because that's not all the students in the class, it's just the people who are in person. So are there any questions about populations, samples, studies and whatnot? Well, with that, that is actually all that there is to chapter one. So if you have any other questions, you're welcome to come up. Just make sure you have your mask on six feet away. Like I said, this is gonna be the shorter one. When you're doing your web work and you're working on the exam, the most overarching thing above all, the two things that are going to pop up the most, scales of measurement, type of data. Above all, the question you should ask yourself, quantitative or categorical, answer that first, always answer that first. You do that, it'll be much easier on you.